People will live in these filming environments. I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. I don't know whether the planning authorities of the UK think it's a good idea or not. We're fighting with them at the moment. But what it did, it shows this hybrid condition. It shows a new typology that is coming forward. And I think that's where I kind of set the challenge as you're talking in the next few days, to kind of find between the edges of discussions in your specialties where there are potential new hybrids, where there are potential new conditions that are coming. And I think for me, Pinewood is crazy enough to do it. The second point I wanted to raise was simply about measurability. I think for too long we've kind of accepted the, the intuitive nature and to kind of see the science that is underpinning this work is critical. Cities, cis complex systems, drawn by one of my engineering colleagues as only a delightful engineer could try to articulate resource flow in cities. Um, but I think the issue for me when we tried to start mapping this back is how do you make visible the invisible. Almost everything that you've spoken about today is relatively invisible. And yet our cities and the issues of deltas and climate change actually have to have a visibility. So you take issues like a carbon clock, energy plotter, eco-reflection, the things that we're playing with at a much more domestic scale to allow people to do it. I think you can do some very interesting things at city scales. Um, and here is the, uh, the, the water barometer for the Thames ring main in London. And that little, you can see that down the bottom of that nice glass tube where it's slightly bluer, that's the water level. When we drink a lot in London, it goes down. When we don't drink as much, the water goes up. There is this kind of making visible the invisible. And so I leave that as an idea to kind of pursue in the reflections of the ideas that are coming forward. Um, and then I'm acutely remembered that, that our ability to communicate is being transformed in front of us in a personal way. And the accessibility to that information, I think, is key. Um, we're thinking of doing a little app for our project in Zaldus to make accessible some of that inaccessible and invisible information. It is important for us, when we're kind of thinking about cities, to be able to quantify these issues to not just kind of leave the statements and the research that we're seeing coming forward from people like the three previous speakers, and how does that actually mean something? This is a, a project that we were looking at in, once again in the United Kingdom. The figures are actually not that relevant. It's the fact that we stand and try to drive a much more specific and measurable condition. But that's not good enough. It goes back to the issue of integration. How do we kind of rebalance and integrate those systems? I was pleased, once again, Pavet is raising the issue of ministries talking to each other, you know, until we can operate at multiple levels of kind of integration from architectural and engineering design at physical levels up to statutory and planning levels. We really are kind of pushing the wrong dimension. We tried to quantify in our terms um, as a working target, and I'm sure any number of you will just take me down for this. So um, how we actually begin to talk about what, it, what, it, what we can talk about as a sustainable lifestyle. Yes, the issues of carbon and the impacts that come with that. The amount of land that it takes for us to live, 1.4 you know, gross hectares per capita, you know, the ecological footprints. Um, but often left behind is the notion of kind of quality and the issues of poverty and human development indices left behind. Somehow in this combination, in this matrix of these variables, we think the notion of sustainable places and appropriate responses. I think the most important thing, I've, hopefully, what I think is important, is left behind, and that's to make places meaningful. I think we can solve issues. You know, and, and Michael kind of scared me a bit when he came here. It's bigger than you think. I, it possibly is, but who knows. But, th but we are kind of people who need to not only take the science with us, but to take the meaning of place with us. You know, there are many reasons why the richness of a Dutch landscape, whether it's in its paintings, whether it's in its architecture, means something. And we have to refine that in the specifics of Delta locations. We cannot just take forward the scientific discussion. There is an anthropological and a social issue that comes forward. We first came across this um, amazingly when we were working on, a, on an incredible project just south of Beijing, Wang Zhuang, a field of cherry orchards that were going to be destroyed, ancient cherry orchards that were the, were the backbone of a community. Um, and in actual fact, 
the strategy of talking to the residents, of, of understanding their kind of cultural relationship with those type of things was key to the making of a new place. And so this notion of human in nature, human in society, human in self, I think are key messages that, that are relevant when one is thinking about delta conditions. You know, the, the maps and the graphs that you saw them showed the different populations in which this very common issue is discussed. And I, I, I would in, implore that we begin to kind of customise and localise those issues going forward. Um, we did this, we began to try to do this in two little projects, one in the United Kingdom, uh, first new town since World War II, uh, in the Cotswolds, so very much floodable, the equivalent of the kind of the Dutch areas. That's all very interesting and, and we can do all the water. The thing that was more interesting was that this was a, an old airfield, an old World War II airfield. And there was a remnant of a memory that was left in place. When those deltas flood, when those river systems expand, we will be losing kind of the physical memories of cities and places. What are we doing about that? How do we address that loss of kind of cultural relevance when we think about changing places? Um, that was on an individual project level. Um, the other thing that amazed me, and I was talking to someone about this just outside, how do you generate the consensus in a greater population that this is actually a meaningful condition? You know, it is very difficult, I think, in many of our societies, particularly our developed societies, to actually generate this collective consensus. You know, there is the example, and I put it up above you, you know, of the lunar landing, you know, the Apollo program. You know, the president in America, in his honeymoon period, says we're going to the moon, and everyone remembers, and we're coming back. Um, and then, lo and behold, it happens nine years later, and it's not an American thing. It's actually humankind walked on the moon, a kind of a collective consensus on that issue. My concern is increasingly that we get that sense of collective response primarily through disaster. There are very few conditions that actually allow us to kind of bring a collective consensus. I think, you know, I'll, I'll leave that for you to interpolate how that relates to deltas. They were the three things that I thought I would kind of try and provoke. So there's an incredibly interesting program that's been going on in parallel to the conference and that's looking at future cities. And uh, I was kind of asked to say, so Malcolm, what do you think of future cities? Well, um, I looked back and we see all these delightful images or not so delightful images of, of Le Corbusier with the delightful cruciform towers or Alexander the Great or George Lucas in Star Wars and even our little project in, in China. And so it's, you know, this is, this is the way you make images of cities, isn't it? Oh, no. No, I think that's the danger. I think we have to fundamentally change the way in which we try to concept, conceptualise place. These are images that are never realised because they are a single point in time so far out that they remain irrelevant. Um, and I really like this notion of, of, of what Patrick Geddes said, that the city is more than this place in space, more than this physicality, it is a true drama in time. And this temporal dimension of the way in which these environments are changing, the delta environments are changing, I think is astounding and, and an astonishing condition that we need to respond to. I was using the example of the fire of London, the little kind of burnt out area, the light grey area is where the fire went through, and then the great Sir Christopher Wren puts a plan down. Do you think it got built like that? Heck no. You know, because the key issue was the speed of response to change. And from the experience of our work around the world at the moment, future cities are characterised by their speed of response to change. A number of people have said we have no time to wait. You know, I can only kind of concur that. And then we tried to communicate this in our Amsterdam project. And here I go, I'll try and communicate it to a thousand people. Um, the little open dot is where we're standing today. The scenarios A and B is where a place could end up. But it is not a single vision. It is a scenario strategy of developing place. And there's a range that we can operate in. And those tolerances in the scientific you know, community are kind of giving us guidelines. But we can no longer talk about future cities with single images and single place. The process of making change comes forward. And so my second last thought is when we were working on a project, a seven-year-old drew an image of his city. 
And if you can look at that, you can actually see he doesn't like where the chewing gum's on, on the pavement. He, he likes where his grandma is. He likes where the park 